morning, friends. If you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. This morning we're going to be in verses 7 through 14. I'm going to go ahead and read this passage for us and, and ask that God would help us to understand and to apply his word. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. Pray with me. Father, we thank you that you are a good God who takes those of us who are spiritually dead and makes us alive in Christ. God, would you help us this morning to understand the contrast between that which which we once were and the life that is in us now? Would you help us to understand through this passage the urgency to live out the life that you have put in us, to understand the motivations to do so, and that this morning would serve as all of us, for all of us, as a divine wake-up call to arise from our slumber and to have the light of Christ shine on us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and New Year's and that everything went exactly as you planned to have happen. That was not the case for the Briggs household. We went back to Southeast Texas uh, and we're planning to be down there for a full week with family and less than 24 hours into being down in Southeast Texas, um, my wife, Lindsay, was uh, wiping off an old porcelain sink which had a crack on the underside that she didn't see and it promptly um, punctured all the way through her thumb and uh, sent us for a lovely three-day, two-night stay in St. Elizabeth Hospital in Southeast Texas. We have a picture of her hand. No, we don't. I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Some of you were like, ah! <laughs> but don't have a picture of it. Uh, the object got taken out. Uh, it did get infected, required antibiotics, and so that's why we were uh, IV antibiotics. That's why we were in the hospital. And um, she's completely fine. Wave your hand just so everybody can see. Lindsay's just fine, everybody. She's <laughs> alive and well. Uh, But, you know, it was interesting just being uh, in a hospital setting, in a hospital room, seeing um, all the different machines that are there to help um, keep someone alive and to help detect life. Uh, There's that one machine in every hospital room that um, tracks someone's heartbeat. And as long as you're hearing like a beep, 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 like there's life. Like you can be sure that life's there. What you don't ever want to hear is like a beep that doesn't ever, you know, take a pause. It means that there's no life there. So there's this thing to detect life. Before any of that modern technology that's so incredible existed, there were other like rudimentary ways to detect if life was present in someone, Um, one of which would be like to kick them or poke them. Uh, You know, you go up and you like poke them in a sensitive area to see if there's a visceral response. Another way that you used to be able to tell or test if life was present in someone is you would take a small mirror or like a piece of glass and just hold it underneath their nose. And if it fogged up, even if there was no appearance of life, there was indeed life detected there. A third way that they used to detect if life was present is that they would take a light and shine it in the eye. And if the pupil responded in any way, no matter how dead the individual looked, if that eye responded to light coming in, there was indeed life there. And I have good news for all of you this morning. The life that Jesus Christ came to provide each and every one of you uh, was never intended to only be able to be slightly detected. Jesus Christ came to give you life and life so abundantly that the joy and the peace uh, of his life would shine brightly through you, so much so that it would be undeniably evident to all the people around you. 
But there's a reason why uh, God put the passage that we're going to be studying today in the scriptures. And the reason that God put this passage in here about the reason that we need to walk as children of light is because we as Christians have a tendency to go sleepwalking. We have a tendency to maintain the habits of church attendance, of giving, of serving, and all the other Christian activities, all the while in the midst of doing those things, we close our eyes to Christ himself. And oftentimes what causes us to close our eyes to Christ himself is we begin to look back into the world that Jesus rescued us from. And we are allured by it. And we are like a lullaby of the temptation of the world brought back towards a spiritual sleep. And we return to living in the very things that Jesus had rescued us from. And so God put this passage in the Bible today to exhort us to walk as that which we have become. So the subject this morning is that we are to be imitators of God by walking as children of light because that is what we are. And you see, when Paul originally delivered this message to the church in Ephesus, the Christians in Ephesus found their Selves in a situation very similar to, to you and me. The Ephesians once were full citizens of Ephesus. And the culture of Ephesus was one which um, celebrated sexual immorality. That was full of greed and vulgarity and impurity of every kind. And what happened is, is these Gentile believers, these Christians in Ephesus, began to walk with Christ they realized that they were not taken out of the world from which they once lived, but yet they were surrounded by the darkness. And they looked back and they began to see the darkness that was around them and there was a temptation that still existed for them and they began to wander back into living in the old patterns of their life. It's called backsliding. And it's something that all of us in this room know personally. All of us know what it's like to return to walking in the patterns of the sinful life that we once used to live. And what's so crazy about that is when we walk back into our old patterns of life, we are forfeiting, we are turning our back to Christ himself and by proxy, the joy and the peace and the hope that he provides for us. A life of goodness and righteousness and truth that he produces in us to return back to the consequences of living in a sinful, dark life. And so God gives this message to the church, not to sleepwalk, but to wake up, to see the direction that you're heading and return to walking as a child of light so that you would know life, that you would know it to the full and that Christ's light would not only shine in you, but shine through you. And then God would use you not only to sanctify his church, but to reach the lost. And so that's why we are gonna be studying this passage this morning. In this passage, we're gonna see Two motivations to walk as children of light, followed by a divine wake-up call. And so let's look first at the first motivation in this passage that we're given to walk as children of light. In verse 8 and through 10, it says this. For you were formerly darkness. You were formerly darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So the first point this morning from this is that you are now light in the Lord. That's your motivation. You are now light in the Lord. So walk that way. Live as children of the light. This point, though, is made by way of contrast, of contrasting the dark life that we were with the new life of light that we are. So we have to understand that metaphor. The metaphor of light and dark throughout the scriptures is used to relate to three aspects of our life, the spiritual, the intellectual, and the moral. When it says in this passage that you were darkness, what it's relating to is the fact that spiritually you were darkness means that spiritually you were dead. When it says, uh, like, intellectually, you are darkness, it means that you are ignorant of the truth. You were like someone wandering around in the dark, not knowing which way to go, and thereby being lost and bringing destruction 
upon yourself all the while, desperately knowing in your inner person that you desire to get out, but you didn't know how. But the result of being spiritually dead and the result of being ignorant of the truth and lost with no way of direction is that you were morally depraved, morally corrupt. And what Paul says, what God is trying to highlight for us is that we need to remember that which we were. Remember the condition of your life. When you were spiritually cut off from God, when there was no hint, no flicker of the life of God in you, remember what it was like to be lost without the truth, trying to find your identity, trying to find hope, trying to find rescue in all the things that the world has to offer, but all of it, you know, ultimately letting you down. And then remember your depravity, your moral decay, that there was nothing good that dwells in you. And now this is the one that we usually wrestle with the most. We have a hard time believing that we indeed were morally depraved and morally corrupt, but it's essential that we do. It's easy for us to look around at moral depravity um, in, in the most grievous expressions of it. When we see murder, when we see um, abortion, when we see like rampant sexual immorality, uh, sexual perversion of both the heterosexual and homosexual varieties. Whenever we see um, like gross vulgarity, like those are easy to spot. And we would say, yeah, that's moral corruption. But the reason why all of us have a hard time, a lot of us have a hard time remembering that we too were morally depraved and corrupt is because we all have taken this large category of sin and made it respectable. And we don't consider it as anything that would be all that bad, but make no doubt about it. Things such as discontentment, ingratitude, worldliness, lack of self-control, impatience, irritability, anger, judgmentalism, jealousy, unwholesome speech, and just the pride of your own self-righteousness and self-worship are all indicators of the moral depravity, the moral corruption that has plagued every single one of this. And you know this to be true. If you are here and you would raise your hand and say, hey, I am a Christian, I am a child of the light, that means at one point in time, you came to the realization that you were darkness, that you had no hope of saving yourself, and you reached out and said, Jesus, will you save me? Will you rescue me? from the darkness that I am, that I can't deliver myself from. So all of you know, if you are here and you've identified yourself with Jesus, you've already identified, you've already acknowledged that you weren't just in the darkness at some point in time. You were darkness. You were spiritually dead, spiritually ignorant, spiritually lost, and morally corrupt. And Paul is saying, remember this. Remember this, because when you, when you look back into the world and you see what's going on and you're tempted to close your eyes to Christ and open your eyes back to the world, remember what your life was like. Remember. Because why would you knowingly walk back into the life which you needed Jesus to rescue you from? Remember that. Remember who you were. And then he says, not only were you darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. It's not just that you've left that life behind, that you've been saved from it, but you are something altogether new, something altogether that consists in your inner being because of Christ saving you, because of his spirit in you, something in your inner being that is all that is good and all that is right and all that is true. And if any of you here, all of you here that are in Christ, you've, you've tasted this in your life. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The peace of Christ reigning in your heart. Not always, but you've known it, you've tasted it. And it's the light of the light of, it's the life of the light of Christ in you. You see, remember this. All the joy that you've ever known in any degree from knowing Jesus, hold on to that. And know that this is the life that you've always been looking for. And the life that you continually wanted to grow into to have a greater joy and a greater peace and the freedom from anxiety and a purpose for your life and a fixed identity that's, that's completely separate from the opinions of other people towards you. All of it, all of it is found and is fixed and is firm 
in the Lord. You are now in Christ, light in the Lord. And so walk as children of light. In this new life that you have, you didn't produce on your own. It's holy as a result of God working in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says it this way. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That is Jesus. God's grace towards you, allowing you to see the light and the life of Jesus and to receive it and then to have that life in you. And the life, the metaphor of light symbolizes that you were once dead, but now you are alive. You know the taste of this life of Christ in you. You once were lost, but now you know the truth. You have direction and wisdom for your life. And you once were morally corrupt, but now you possess a moral purity in you that can be walked out, that you can experience the joy of. And so the first motivation is this contrast of light and dark and the fruit of the light versus the fruit of the darkness. Do you remember the fruit of your life apart from Christ when you were darkness? The emptiness, maybe the emptiness that was there amid great worldly success, but it was there nonetheless. He's saying, remember the fruit of this darkness, this immorality, this lostness, this complete lack of spiritual life, and then hold it up next to the the life that you know in him, that you've come to see in Jesus. And therefore, keep your eyes wide open. Keep looking at Christ. Keep going deeper in your relationship with him. How? By taking in God's word as if it was your breath and by exhaling with God as if it were your prayer through which you grow in intimacy with him. And in doing so, the fruit of that will be goodness and righteousness and truth. What is good and what is right and what is true will not only be in you, but it will come through you. Others will look in your life and they will see the expression of this goodness in you constantly seeking the good of others before your own to do good to all. The fruit of righteousness that you have been declared right before God and before, and so therefore you seek to always do right before others. And the fruit of truth, that you walk in what has clearly been revealed by God as what is true, and so you have direction in this life and how to navigate it. And these two things couldn't be more different than each other. And so he says, because of this, what you once were and what you are now Walk as children of light. Don't go back to sleep again. Because all that awaits for you, if you close your eyes to Christ and turn back to look again at the world, is the consequences, the earthly consequences of your sin that you once lived in. But we are a sleepy people. We are a sleepy people. We have a tendency all the time to close our eyes to Jesus and to look back to the world. Um, And the most dangerous thing about that is we can close our eyes to Christ and turn back to the world all the while looking like we're we're wide awake. Have you ever known anybody that was a sleepwalker? Nobody? I used to be a sleepwalker. When I was like in elementary school, um, I would sleepwalk. Most of the times I would get up and um, I'd just kind of wander around the house and it wasn't that big a deal. But there was one time when I got up and uh, went outside and started walking down the street. My parents were frantically searching for me. And when they found me outside walking down the street, they came and they asked me where I was going. And I told them I was going to grandma's house. You know, like where else would an elementary kid want to go? I was going to grandma's house. And so they, you know, got me, put me back into the bed. And the next morning, they asked me if I had any recollection of what I did the night before. And I didn't. And that's what the danger of sleepwalking is, is we often can have this appearance of being alive, of knowing what we're doing, but yet it's all activity, but, but no substance to it, no realization of it. And when it comes to the Christian life, and when it comes to a Christian spiritually sleepwalking, the danger is, is that 
you and I can have the appearance of being awake to Jesus, all the while having our eyes closed to him. We can give the appearance of being awake by coming to church services, by uh, showing up to community group, by giving of your resources to the work of the local church, by even serving the community around you, all the while you've been lulled to sleep by the culture around you. Time on your screen and social media has replaced time with the Lord. You began to close your eyes to the scriptures. You've ceased to pray. And therefore, your relationship with Christ erodes. And as you have closed your eyes to him, and as you have turned your back on him, the joy and the peace and the fixed identity that you were holding on to slowly begins to dissipate and to wither. And it's replaced with you falling back into the patterns of life that you once lived in. You begin to drink a little bit more. You begin to judge people a little bit more often. You begin to hold on to grudges uh, a little bit longer than you used to. You begin to allow the vanity of the materialism of the American culture, culture to capture your heart and to entertain your thoughts more than the glorious inheritance that comes in Christ. And as you do that, the joy and the hope and the peace that you once were experiencing in full, you notice, whether you know it or not, beginning to be replaced by anxiety, guilt, shame, people-pleasing, and all the more things that could come with it. And so although you have this appearance of being alive, you've in fact fallen asleep. And in doing so, you're forfeiting the vitality of your spiritual life that can only come through being wide awake in your relationship with Jesus Christ. So as we get to this new year in January, many of you are evaluating, what is the condition of my life? What went well last year? What needs to go better this year? And some of you are asking yourself the question as you evaluate the current condition of your life, how did I get here? (laughs) What went wrong this past year to allow my life to be in the current state that it's in? How did I end up with so much anxiety? How did I end up feeling so disconnected from the Lord? How did I end up with the lust of the flesh being so strong and controlling in my life? And the answer to that question is this. You've fallen asleep. You've been sleepwalking. And because you've been sleepwalking, you've been forfeiting the life of Jesus Christ, the light of Christ in you. And this passage is to serve for you and for me as a wake-up call. To open your eyes. To turn them back to Jesus. To take them off of the world and to look at Christ. And his light will shine on you. And the mold of moral corruption that has begun to grow in your heart will be killed. And the life will return. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. Amen? That's the first motivation. There's another one. It gets better. And the second motivation in this passage for why we are to walk as children of light is this, because as we walk in a relationship with Jesus, as we abide with him through his word, through prayer, through belonging to his body, through taking part of the Lord's Supper, through being involved when there's baptisms from all the communal life of of being in his body. As you do all of these things, you are walking in his light. As his light shines on you, as his life through his spirit comes into you, you begin to grow. And what does it mean to grow? You grow in Christ's likeness, which means that the goodness and the righteousness and the truth that's evident in Jesus himself begins to blossom in your life. And people look, they say, look at that young man. Can you believe how different, how good he is in contrast to the lostness of all the young adults around him? 
Look at that young mom. Can you see the way that in the midst of the hardship of homemaking, amen, she's full of joy. She's serving her family as if she was raising an army of God right there in her own home. Look at that young woman. And because she's walking in the light of Christ, the light of Christ is shining through her and through him. And do you know what happens when light shines into the darkness? The things that were once dark get exposed for what they really are. It's what Paul says in this passage is the second motivation for us to walk as children of light. To walk that as which we are is because when we walk as children of light, we expose the deeds of darkness for what they really are. That's the second point this morning. You will expose deeds of darkness when you walk as a child of light. Let me show you in verses 11 through 13. It says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. And so we've already been told at the beginning of chapter 5 that we're not to participate with the sons of disobedience, with, the, with those who we once were. We're not to associate with the people who were still spiritually dead in the sense that we're not to get involved with the same sinful deeds of darkness that they are enslaved to. We're not to go back to that kind of life. We've already been told about that. Josh taught on about it last week. We're given the, the, that same instruction here, but then he adds on to it. He adds on to it <clears throat> to give the second part of why we're not to participate in these deeds. And he says the reason that we're not to participate in these deeds is because we, we not just avoid the sinful life, but we live a life walking in a relationship with Jesus, we expose how worthless, how worthless the life of sin is compared to the overwhelming fruitfulness of a life that comes from walking with Jesus. And so we're not simply to avoid sinning, we're to walk faithfully with Jesus in his light as children of light. And when Christians live that way, when Christians live that way, the world looks upon it and it's undeniable the difference that Jesus makes in a person's life. The worthlessness of sin is exposed for what it is when Christians walk in goodness and righteousness and truth because that's what they are. And it even says about these deeds of darkness that how, how unfruitful are these deeds of darkness? It says so much so that the acts and the consequences of the deeds of darkness done in secret are disgraceful, shameful, too unfruitful, too worthless to even speak about. Think about that for a minute. This is relating to largely the moral corruption of the world, the moral corrupt corruption of the lost. Is moral corruption being lived out in broad daylight in the culture, culture around us? Yes. You don't have to look very far to see moral corruption in action all over the place in broad daylight. And when it comes to showing how worthless and how unfruitful moral, living in moral corruption is, the point that's being made here is if you can imagine that these things are taking place in broad daylight... If you take that kind of corruption and you put it completely in the dark, where it can be given full expression, where no one sees it, how much more dark will it be? Exponentially more. And I won't expand any more because it would be disgraceful to speak about. But when darkness is combined with secrecy and isolation, it's being able to give full expression and its end is complete destruction of a person's life. But God has a solution for exposing it. And do you know what the solution is that God has for exposing how worthless darkness is, how worthless sin is? Do you know what his solution is? It's you. It's you. It's you and it's me. But the way that God's designed to use his people to expose how worthless sin 
is, is not through the way that Christians talk, but through the way that Christians walk. Not by what we say, but by how we live. Because look, any of us could go around calling out verbally uh, moral corruption. But if we spend all of our time calling out moral corruption, but then yet ourselves living in it, the only thing that we are going to expose, the only thing that you are going to expose is that you are a hypocrite. And the inconsistency of your Christian life is going to invalidate the credibility of the power of Christ. God works through our walk, but when we do not walk as children of light, we take a big old basket and cover up the light of Christ that is in us, and the world can't see it. And now God is going to have to find another group of people, other Christians who have set their hearts to walk as children of light, that he may shine through them to accomplish his sovereign will of redemption and salvation. And so we're to walk as children of light because God works through our walk. And he works through our walk in two ways, to both to sanctify his church and then also to reach the lost. How does God work through our walk to sanctify the church? Um, if we were to take a poll in here, of everyone who identifies as a Christian on if you have ever in the past, in your lifetime, since knowing Christ, slid back into sin, started sleepwalking, everyone who's honest would, would vote, yes, I've done that. I've backslid and I've gone back into sinful patterns in my life. If we took a look at the past year, the past six months, the past month, the past week, largely all of us would be in that camp. We are, we are sleepy people. And God's solution for showing us that we have fallen asleep even when we don't know it is by the light of Christ shining through our brothers and sisters. And so if it's the Christian life that shows the light of Christ, the way that God uses that to sanctify his church is that God uses the faithfulness of other people living for him and with him to expose where we are not. And that is a gift. That's not something to bring guilt and shame upon any of us. It's a gift. Why? Because if we're not exposed for where we're not walking with Jesus, what awaits us is the sinful earthly consequences, the earthly consequences of our sin that we once lived in. But whenever we do life together, and I see brothers and sisters walking in faithfulness and possessing a joy that I've lost, it exposes that in some way I've walked back into the darkness. I've fallen asleep and it helps me to wake up. But it's often the case where when a church family settles for gathering on Sundays as the life together of the church that you're spending 98% of the rest of your Christian life, if you're not doing life together apart from Sunday mornings, walking around with no other lights shining before you. And so it gets really easy if we're not doing life together when the church is scattered for all of us to fall into sleep and to not know that we are sleeping. And we get stuck in these sinful patterns and these sinful habits, habits and slowly the entire church, the entire church family loses its joy and loses its peace and has the appearance of being alive. Meanwhile, is spiritually have fallen asleep. It's what we call a dead church. And it may take some very delicate test to determine that the life of Christ is still in them and they may pass it, but they are not shining like a light in the world. So we must be doing life together that God can work through us to sanctify us, to help us each experience the more fullness of the life that God has always intended for us. And this is critically important for us to understand because we've spent the past two years in a global pandemic. And from my observation, there has been a, a massive unintended consequence of trying to navigate the, this pandemic um, with a view on physical health only. Whenever we've, um, this pandemic came, rightfully so, we, were, we have been very cautious in seeking how do we love our neighbor well, and how do we care for each other? But the pattern of life that many of us have revolved into is to begin to distance ourselves relationally from other people. 
There may be times once a week where we gather in proximity, but the life together that we used to know in no way resembles our life now. And so what's happened is many of us have established this new rhythm of life where we are largely walking in isolation from other lights. We're not actually seeing the lives of other brothers and sisters. We're not with them. We're not around them. We may be here together this morning, but then we go about and we sit in our cubes or our offices and then we get in our cars and we go home and we become relationally disconnected. And because of that, nothing is exposing the sin that is beginning to grow back into our life. Nothing is exposing the fact that we are actually sleepwalking and sin is overtaking your life. And it's no wonder that even in the church, anxiety and depression and addiction and anger and hate is growing. So there's a divine wake-up call here to return to life together, not flippantly, but to return to life together together because we need each other. We need to be walking alongside other people who are living lives of faithfulness, whose joy is shining brightly so that we ourselves don't fall asleep and slowly wither and die, holding on but just the faintest spark of spiritual life of union with Christ that'll get us into heaven. You're losing everything else. So we must return to life together. And as we do that, as we live that way, each other's light will shine to expose the deeds of darkness that we have gone back to. And when someone's light, the way that someone is living joyfully with the Lord, shows you where you have fallen asleep, when that light shines brightly in your eyes, don't turn away from it in guilt and shame. Run to it. Run to the light because it's where the joy of your salvation is going to return. Practically, how do you do that? How do you wake up from your sleep? You admit. You admit that you have fallen asleep in your spiritual life. And then you confess the specific nature of the sins that you have fallen back into. Then you remember the gospel, that Jesus has paid the penalty for it, that you are a child of God, that his grace is there to redeem and to restore you. And then you walk in repentance. Run to the light, admit, confess, remember, and repent, and have your joy restored. Don't continue to walk in a slumber. And then as we do that for one another, God works through our walk to convict the lost. Did you know that you can do nothing to convict someone who's dead in their sins and transgressions? You can do nothing. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. But we can be certain that God through his spirit will enable someone who is spiritually dead to see the light of the life of someone walking as a child of light and use that to convict them and bring them to an admission of their need for rescue and for conversion and to be born again. So God will use our walk to show the credibility of Jesus as a savior and to bring the lost to him. And so we walk as children of light to expose the deeds of darkness. And God will use that to sanctify his church and reach the lost. This passage ends logically at the conclusion of this argument with the divine wake up call. And it says, For this reason, for these two motivations, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine. On you. The third point this morning is wake up. Wake up and enjoy the light of Christ shining on you. Many of you this morning don't need to be convinced that you've been spiritually asleep, you already know it. God knows you've been sleeping. Christ knows you've been sleeping. But yet, don't let that be a cause for guilt and shame. Don't let the fact that you've backslidden into the pattern of sin in your life be something that that keeps you from returning to the light of Christ, 
who is there to shine on you if you would but turn back to him. Turn back to him. Charles Spurgeon, when preaching this verse, said this. The Christian existence is within you. That is, if you have received Christ as your Savior, his life is in you. But the manifestation is so feeble that it is not seen. You do not know whether you are, you are alive. Why, nobody ever doubts whether he is alive. A man in health never says, I do not know whether I am alive or not. He goes to work. He takes his plow and drives it across the field or goes to his business and works all day long. And he knows he is alive by what he does. And if some of you Christian people would only wake up from your sleepy state and begin to labor for God, to love souls, you would get such joy flooding through your spirits as you never knew before. It would be as though heaven had wound up its floodgates and let the river of the water of life come bursting into your soul. And instead of being like a dry, howling wilderness, there would be a standing pool of water. No, even a place in which the ships of your joy and the galley with oars of your delight might sail for many a day. Joy to the full, if you would but wake up from your sleepy state and walk with Jesus. But for those of you who are so full of fear and guilt and shame that you're afraid to turn to Christ, I want to remind you of the compassion that Jesus has to those who are his. In Isaiah chapter 42, the first several verses of that talk about our servant Messiah and give an explanation of his Character In Isaiah 42, 3, it says this, A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not put out. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Let me remind you that the servant Messiah brought forth justice for your sin by paying the full penalty of it on the cross. So no matter what extent you've fallen asleep, no matter what extent you've returned to living in the death of your sin of your former life, if there is only but a flicker of the life of God in you, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus will not snuff it out. He waits. He's waiting for you to turn to him. And when you do, his light will take that smoldering flicker of the life of God in you and set it ablaze. And his light will shine on you and you will begin to know joy and know peace to the full. Wake up. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, we are so grateful that you are compassionate and kind, slow to get angry, abounding in loving kindness. We thank you, God, that you know our frame, that you, you know that we are but dust. You know that we are weak and feeble people who are prone to fall asleep in our walk. We thank you that you do not leave us behind, but in your kindness, you send messages to us to help us remember the darkness and the death and the despair of our former lives apart from you and to remind us of the, the taste of heaven, of joy and of peace, friendship, family that comes from knowing Christ and belonging to your family. So God, I pray that you would help us to be people who have our eyes so fixed on Jesus that we would never fall asleep. That as the light of Christ shines on us, that goodness and righteousness and truth would grow like a roaring flame and that the darkness of Fort Worth, of Benbrook, of Alito, of Crowley, of Arlington, of Keller, of Brock would see it. 
that they would come, that they would come to the light and that they would know you. And God, I pray if there's any of these friends in the room who have been sleeping and this morning realize that they are awake, would grab as soon as possible someone in their community and would admit that they've been sleeping would confess the specific nature of what that has run to, that the community around them would then remind them of the gospel, help them return to a place of rest in their soul and to fix their eyes on Jesus and to walk as a child of light. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.